Oh, hi there. <clears throat> yes, so earlier today, I went out for my long, a nice long walk, and I ended up at Shoppers Drug Mart because it's one of the exciting places to go here in the city of Thunder Bay, and I found the latest issue of Archaeology Magazine. Now, you may be thinking, ah, clearly he grabbed it because it's going to talk about Viking Age silver from Scotland. And you're not wrong, but I also noticed this headline here, When Demons Roamed Egypt. And I thought to myself, I know all about demons roaming Egypt, but with my master's special essay back at the University of Toronto in 2009 being all about John Cassian and demonology of the Desert Fathers and tying in Evagrius of Pontus and all of these sorts of things and the stories that you read there. So I grabbed it knowing that it probably wouldn't be about the Desert Fathers, and I was right. It's an interesting article that I've begun but not finished because I wanted to make this video instead. And the article is about Pharaonic Egypt, because if you see, put the word Egypt with no adjectives, besides maybe ancient, in an article in anything to do with history or the popular media, you usually mean Pharaonic Egypt. Anyway, so it's about the traditional religion of ancient Egypt and the emergence in the early Middle Kingdom period, a sort of 2030 BC, of a host of lesser spirits other than the big official gods that we all know about, right, Osiris and Ra and whatnot, lesser things, lesser divinities, that the scholar liter literature calls demons in a very good Greek etymological use of the word. We could call them daimones if we so desire. And these beings are sort of creatures on the edge of the world of the big gods, right? Sort of creatures at their threshold, lesser divinities who maybe protect them, help them out, lesser things that might help you out in your life, that sort of thing. I have to read the whole article to find out what exactly the ancient Egyptian religion had to say about these lesser beings, but that's not, they're not an uncommon phenomenon in ancient religion. This idea that there are numinous beings inhabiting us, that we live in a world full of gods, that there are millions and millions of spiritual creatures, and that these lesser divinities, these daimones, are here now with us. And we need to watch out for them. We need to seek their aid. We need to appease their wrath. We need to walk backwards down the hallway, spitting beans out if we're an ancient Roman paterfamilias. These are the sorts of things you need to do. I wrote on a, bl a blog once about uh, St. Augustine's list of all of these lesser divinities of the ancient Roman religion. These are just part of the universe that ancient people inhabited. And in Christianity, to get, of course, onto the sorts of things that I tend to talk about in these videos, in Christianity, there has been a general belief that not just these lesser divinities, but also the greater divinities too, like, say, Zeus Amon, Jupiter Dolicanus, or, you know, just good old-fashioned Vulcan, are also demons. Right? So when you, and this was not an interpretation I had sort of known about when I was growing up. And when I first read the story of St. Alban in The Venerable Bede, St. Alban is brought before the Roman magistrate on the day of his martyrdom. And the Roman magistrate is performing sacrifices to his demons. And I didn't realize that from the perspective of the magistrate, these were the gods. I thought, oh, whoa, Bede believed that these guys like worshipped demons, that they were into demon worship. And he did. Except that he would have said, the, but they thought they were worshipping real gods, that, you know, they were deceived. Which, and St. Augustine gets into all sorts of the theology or theory behind all of that sort of thing about how people can be deceived by the demons and end up worshipping them as gods. So, this is a really interesting thing. But today, I don't think we're necessarily that into demons or into the satanic. Um... And, of course, this uh, plays itself into a great quote from Robertson Davies that no one believes in the devil nowadays, and this is the devil's favorite joke. So, so these things are going on, but I have hovering at the edges of my consciousness, if you're one of those strange creatures who follows what I say on Twitter, I have hovering on the edges of my consciousness 
this connection between the demonic and pulp sword and sorcery. And I'm going to tie in St. Athanasius in a moment. But I think about this, um, the Desert Fathers, that's the sort of where we're going with Aeth Athanasius and Conan the Barbarian. Because what happens in these stories is you go forth out of the city. You leave behind civilization, um, whether you're leaving behind the towns of the Nile Valley or you're leaving behind... Um, the great cities of the great empires of the Hyborian age. Doesn't really matter. But you're going out. You're going out into the world beyond where men have dwelt, beyond the tamed places, into the untamed places, into the wilds. And there you can find ancient tombs, and in them, perhaps entrapped, you will find a demon that drives men mad. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? That's a, that's a Conan the Barbarian story right there. Um, and you need to face it. And of course, and in a Conan the Barbarian story, though, um, Conan, straightforward, wily, he's not a fool. He's not a moron. He's not an idiot. He's a, but he's straightforward, yet wily sort of man. He's not interested in sort of magic and ensorceling things. He will avoid being ensorceled, and he will use brute strength. In the Egyptian desert, on the other hand, in the late antiquity, you go forth from the city and you go to the tombs and there you meet the demons and you fight the demons and you wrestle with the demons and you chant the Psalms and you come out victorious. There's a story about Abba Macarius that one night he was out walking between one place and another and he was looking for a place to rest and so he went and went and slept in some old abandoned tombs. Why is it always tombs? But it is. And while he was there, while Abba Macarius was sleeping, he had a vision of demons. And they were coming through and they were going before their commander. Sort of, I guess, the Desert Fathers had something like a Frank Peretti imagination at some level. Or maybe Frank Peretti and the Desert Fathers are tapping into the truth. Anyway... And, he, and they were reporting to him about all of their great activities. And I think what's really important here about this story, and you know, they talk about all the things they were doing, that what they're trying to do, these demons, they're trying to tempt monks away from the monastic life, trying to distract them from prayer. But none of them is able to stand up against Macarius the Great, St. Macarius the Spirit Bearer. So this is interesting that the great thing that the demons in the monastic literature do isn't necessarily wrestling with people. It's not like the exorcist with demonic possession, although there are such stories. Um, it is, in fact, distracting the monks at prayer. The monks have gone out from the cities. The cities have been tamed and the cities have been Christianized. The gods have been driven forth from their temples, um, possibly by Constantine, depending on how you read that evidence, certainly by the time of Theodosius the Great. And so the demons have been driven out. People are getting baptized left, right, and center. And then what do the, the soldiers of Christ do next? They take the battle from the cities to the countryside where the demons have fled. They go and they invade the old pagan temples there and they turn them into their own little... Um, own little monks' cells. They go into the tombs where the demons are hiding, and they go th everywhere, and there's nowhere that is left to be safe for the demons. And this creates what we think of as a monk. And they do battle against the demons night and day for the salvation of their souls and the salvation of the world. So that's what's going on. That's called desert literature. That is exactly what's going on. David Brack, very good book on this called Demons and the Making of the Monk. So this is what's going on in the desert literature. It's, it is actually basically like a sword and sorcery story, except instead of swords, they come armed with copies of the Book of Psalms. Instead of muscles, they have prayer. Instead of standing and grappling with their hands, they lie prostrate on the ground. Um, and they come out and they fight these de demonic things, and they come out victorious in the end. And so sort of 
these things are all in my mind because this is an important topic that we don't talk about and it's a topic that the fathers talk about and it's a topic i'm going to talk about in my upcoming course on saint athanasius because i think we need to so we give you a bit of athanasius now two things first on the incarnation as translated by father john bear in the uh, svs press popular patristics series chapter 47 in father john's uh translation and formerly everywhere was filled with the deceit of the oracles and the utterances of those in Delphi and Dodona and Boeotia and Lycia and Libya and Egypt and Kabiri and the Pythoness were admired in the imagination of human beings. But now, since Christ is announced everywhere, their madness has also ceased and no longer is there anyone among them giving oracles. Formerly demons deceived human fantasy. Sorry, they deceived human fancy, not fantasy, although both, really. Taking possession of springs or rivers, wood or stone, and by their tricks, thus stupefied the simple. But now, after the divine manifestation of the word has taken place, their illusion has ceased. For by the sign of the cross, if a human being but use it, he drives away their deceits. Formerly, human beings thought to be gods, they spoke of as gods by the poets Zeus and Cronus and Apollo and the heroes, and went astray in worshipping them. But now that the Saviour has appeared among human beings, these are known to be mortal humans, and Christ alone among humans is known to be God of true God, the God Word. I love that Bear translates it as the God Word. What could one say about the magic which was admired among them? That before the sojourn of the word, it was, it was strong and active among the Egyptians and Chaldeans and Indians and astounded those who saw it. But at the advent of truth and the manifestation of the word, this also has been confuted and thoroughly destroyed. So that's just, that's just the first paragraph of chapter 47. It talks partially about demons, about, about magic, about the worship of pagan gods who were no gods because they were humans or demons. Um, but how these things are driven away. That the demons are no longer de de deceiving people. And this is a uh, proof that the Christ did on the cross is efficacious. That God became man so that man might become God. That God came down and he died. And his death has destroyed death. And it has destroyed the wiles of the devil and all of his minions, which includes the demonic realm. And this is what the demonic is up to. It's up to deceiving the hearts of men. And uh, he goes on. Um, to talk about how um, demons are, you know, demons are put to flight by the power of the cross and by the name of Christ and by the prayers of Christians. And so all of these things are gone. And also, of course, the demon possessed are set free. Um, I can't think right now of any of the stories from the Desert Fathers themselves, but sort of their later contemporary St. Martin of Tours. So, so we're talking about three eighties is when his life gets written down by Sulpicius Severus. So over in Gaul, but himself of the same wider ascetic monastic tradition. He casts out demons. We know about this. Um, and one of the stories, this is because I'm a boy, this story grasps, grasps my mind, is that he comes to a house and there's a demon-possessed man there and the demon doesn't want him to be able to enter the house and he prays and he sticks his fingers into the man's mouth and the power of the holiness of the saint causes the man to have a great gushing of poop and he poops out the demon thus setting the man free but you see the power of christ the power of the saints um involves being able to beat up the demons right saint columba does the same thing he has a combat with demons on the shores of iona to protect the monastery there's also a story this is a story from egypt about demons there are lots of stories about demons we could go on i can just keep going um Shanudi of Atrope, when a, a demon turned up at the white monastery disguising itself as an imperial official there to take some tax. Let the reader understand. Saint Shanuti beat the demon up and kicked it out, thus saving the monastery from its deception. And why are they able to do these great things though? Well, that's what Saint Athanasius talks about. The, the devil has been defeated definitively. The coming of God as a man and his death upon the cross destroys the power of the demons. All you need is the name of Jesus. All you need is the sign of the cross. All you need is a prayer. All you need is to chant a psalm. And their power over you is gone and destroyed. They cannot possess you when you are filled with Christ. The seal of Christ 
You've been marked with the cross as Christ's own forever. You've been anointed with oil at chrismation. You have been washed clean in the waters of baptism and arise, one, oneed to Christ, united with him. And so all you ever need to do is look to him and he will give you the strength you need to be able to fight the demons. And of course, the demons aren't just wrestling with saints on the beach or possessing some man in the house down the street. And they're not just, in fact, those are the things they are perhaps less likely to do. We are going to get to one more of those stories next. But this is just to bring us, keep us focused on the encounters with the demonic that we can read about in ancient Christianity. Um, they're also not just like in the Frank Peretti novel, This Present Darkness, where some guy's like physically wrestling with the demon in his living room. Mostly they're here to tempt you. That's what John Cassian is here to tell you. John Cassian is here to tell you mostly they're here to tempt you. They want to distract you from prayer. They want to entice you to sin. And so what you need to do is come up with strategies to focus your mind at prayer and to grow in virtue instead of at sin, sin. So think about that. That's what they're out there. They're out there to do these things. They're out there to do these things to you. And I have lots more to say, but we want to do some Antony as well. So in my Athanasius course, we'll be reading about on the incarnation and the power of Christ to completely destroy and obliterate the power of the devil and the demons. That's there. We'll also be reading the life of Antony. So here I have, this is the translation um, from the Cistercian Studies version. And I don't know who translated the Greek, whether it was Tim Vivian or Apostolos Athanasakis. I think, I'm guessing it's the guy with the Greek name who did the Greek, because I know Tim Vivian is, does a lot of Coptic stuff. So, but here's the Greek version, which is the original. Before we get going, just for those of you who are like random scholars who wander onto my YouTube page, I know this is not by the hand of Athanasius or spoken by Athanasius to his scribe, however you think he composed things. But Tim Barnes makes the really important point that within an Athanasius' lifetime, it was attributed to Athanasius and he never said it wasn't, which means that he approves of the content of this, that we can say it is Athanasian in a very important, very real way. And in fact, um, Father John, um, Father John Bear, argues that this is basically a continuation of the treatise on the Incarnation. So, and it is this showing the power of the ongoing life of Christ and the really interesting parallels um, going on with the life of Antony and the life of Christ and how Antony is himself a recapitulation of Christ's recapitulation of Adam and that it is evidence that the Incarnation has never stopped, that the Church is the body of Christ, alive, at work, in the world, even now. So let's read. Chapter 8. In this way, then, Antony girded himself and left for the tombs that lay some distance from his village. After asking one of his friends to bring him bread every few days, he went into one of the tombs and, closing the door of the tomb behind him, remained inside alone. The enemy, however, could not stand his being there. He was afraid that little by little Antony would turn the desert into a city of asceticism. Spoiler alert, that's exactly what he does. Continuing. Coming out one night with a mob of demons, he beat Antony with so many blows that he was left lying on the ground, unable to speak because of the torturous blows. <coughs> Antony said with certainty that human beings could never wield such blows or inflict such punishment. So great was his suffering. But by the providence of God, for the Lord does not disregard those who hope in him. The next day, Antony's friend came, bringing some bread for him. When he opened the door and saw Antony lying on the ground as though dead, he lifted him up and carried him to the village church and laid him on the ground. Many of his relatives and people from the village sat down around Antony as though he were dead. Around midnight, though, Antony regained consciousness and raised himself up. When he saw all of them asleep and only his friend keeping watch, he beckoned the friend to come over and asked him to pick him up again and carry him back to the tomb without waking anyone. So Antony was carried back to the tomb by this man, and with the door closed, as was his custom, he was once again inside by himself. 
He did not have the strength to stand because of the blows from the demons, but continued to pray while lying down. And after his prayer, he would cry out, Look, here I am, Antony. I will not run from your blows. Even if you do worse things to me, nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. Then he also recited the psalm. Though an army should array itself against me, my heart will not be afraid. That's Psalm 27, verse 3. The ascetic thought and said these things, but the enemy, who hates what is good, was amazed that after all these blows, Antony was brave enough to return. Summoning his dogs, and so angry that he was about to burst, the devil said, You see that neither with the spirit of fornication nor with blows have we stopped this fellow. On the contrary, he stubbornly opposes us. Let us approach him some other way. It is easy for the devil to take on other forms to do evil. That night, the demons made such a racket that the whole place seemed to be shaken apart. The demons acted as though they had torn down the four walls of the little room and seemed to be entering through them, having taken on the fantastical appearance of wild beasts and reptiles. Suddenly, the place was filled with the illusory shapes of lions, bears, leopards, bulls, and poisonous snakes, and scorpions, and wolves, and each of them was moving about in ways appropriate to its own form. The lion was roaring, waiting to, wanting to leap on him. The bull acted as though it would gore him. The snake crawled forward, but did not reach him. The wolf rushed at him, but then stopped. Absolutely terrible were the cacophonous ravings of all these apparitions and the howling of their voices. Antony, lacerated and stabbed by the beasts, felt even more terrible bodily suffering. But lying down without moving, he was even more vigilant in his soul. He groaned because of the pain in his body, but was in control of his thoughts. This is desert literature. In control of his thoughts. This is exactly what the, the fathers teach. Your mind wandering around all over, you will not stand up against the demons. They don't need to physically beat you up if your mind is already wandering. They can distract you with the thought of, oh golly, what am I buying for lunch tomorrow? That's how easy we are destroyed, but not St. Anthony. He was in control of his thoughts, and as though he were mocking the demons, oh man, trash-talking demons, this is the guy. If you had any power in you, one of you would be enough. But since the Lord has taken away your power, you attempt to terrify me any way you can by sheer numbers. Mimicking the forms of irrational beasts as you do only demonstrates your weakness, however. Once again, he spoke courageously. If you are able and have received authority against me, do not hesitate, but attack now. But if you are not able, why do you bother me to no purpose? Our seal and wall of protection is our faith in the Lord. In short, they attempted to do many things against him and gnashed their teeth at him. Yet they only mocked themselves all the more, not him. The Lord did not forget Antony's struggle at that time, but came to his help. Looking up, Antony saw the roof appear to open a beam of light descend on him. Suddenly, the demons vanished, and the pain in his body immediately ceased, and his dwelling was once again whole. Antony perceived the Lord's help, and when he took a deep breath and realized that he had been relieved of his suffering, he entreated the vision that had appeared to him. Where are you? Why did you not appear at the beginning so you could stop my sufferings? And a voice came to him. Antony, I was here, but I waited to see your struggle, and now, since you persevered and were not defeated... I will be a helper to you always and will make you famous everywhere. When Antony heard these things, he stood and prayed, and he became so strong that he felt in his body more strength than he had had before. He was about 35 years old at that time. So there we have um, one of the famous stories, the temptations. That's the temptations of St. Antony, Hieronymus Bosch fans. So what are we to make of all this, though? What are we supposed to be thinking? What am I driving at here? You're probably wondering. What I want to say is... I'd, we are going through some sort of seismic civilizational shift right now. I think that the insanity of the internet is showing us that. It's an insanity we bring upon ourselves. The madness that goes on on Twitter, on Facebook, on... I don't know what goes on on Instagram. It's, it looks terrifying. Um, the just general... Chaos, basically, I think, honestly, believe. And um, our culture is becoming rootless, right? There is no more lighthouse. There is no safe harbor. 
We drift about. We are tossed to and fro on the sea. We have nowhere to go and find anchor. Um, many old certainties are coming apart, not always because of the internet, um, but just to think of us Christians. Uh, let's think. I'm an Anglican, raised in the Anglican Church of Canada, still a communicating member of the Anglican Church of Canada. But, and so, and until like, say, 2007, people will say, oh yeah, you're an Orthodox Anglican, that's normal, why are you there? Now people ask me, why are you still part of the Anglican Church of Canada? Oh, well, gee, because I grew up in it, and it was confirmed in it, and I was catechized in it, and everything, nothing I believe is contrary to what they teach. Anyway, um, there's still a place for us at the table in the Anglican Church of Canada. Anyway, that's a different video. That's my unconversion video. Nevertheless, but you can see there's this confusion. Why shouldn't, why not join as though if, if I lived in a city with the options, could I not join the Anglican mission? Could I not join the Anglican Catholic Church? Could I not join the Anglican network in Canada? Uh, could I not join some other schismatic group of Anglicans or not Anglicans at all? Why don't I convert to Eastern Orthodoxy? Why don't I become a member of the local society of St. Pius X Church? Why don't I become a Ukrainian Catholic? Why don't I? But why not? Why am I still here? Where I am? All of a sudden, these a range of things are open to me that people, you know, I don't think that people like 20 years ago would be, you know, except for like a certain kind of Baptist who wants you to become a Baptist. I don't think that my friends 20 years ago would be asking me these sorts of questions. So, but the world is shifting and changing and confusing. And maybe someday there will come a time where there is no room in the Anglican Church of Canada left for me. And so we're going out. And so what happens is, in many ways, our civilization, I think, is falling, is, is tearing itself apart, right? No one is tearing, we're, we're destroying ourselves from the inside. Whether we're talking about politics or pop culture, internet stuff, novels, poetry, poetry, what poetry? If it's not Malcolm Guide or Scott Cairns, I'm not there. Just as materialism and postmodernism and whatever you want to imagine are barreling towards whatever sorts of logical conclusions they have, as things like transhumanism and posthumanism are making their, their rearing their ugly heads, as secularism continues to try to push those things that, that have actual, true, absolute meaning out of discourse. Um, as all of these things are going on, we can't, we are becoming further and further estranged from ourselves. And so the world's become a weirder and crazier place. And I think that first of all, Christians need to realize that as we go out, we're going to find ourselves metaphorically speaking at crossroads than more often than before. And I bring, I bring up the term, the idea of crossroads, because that is sort of where do demons like to hide in the sort of more mythological versions of this literature, not necessarily the tombs of the dead, although that's in Antony. Um, as John Cassian talks a little bit about this, that there's, before he gets into the fact that mostly you should be concerned about them tempting you, but you should also, you know, people talk about how there are certain kinds of demons who lurk at crossroads and beat people up. Well, we're going to be going out and we're going to be hitting these spiritual crossroads. And there are going to be demons waiting there to beat us up. Um, people, clergy are getting burnt out and wanting to leave their churches. Churches are hemorrhaging membership in North America. It doesn't really matter anymore. All of those proud things that uh, conservative churches were saying about ourselves 20 years ago. Well done, us. Well done, our numbers are better. Our numbers are better. Our numbers are not good. So we're going out, we're finding this bewilderment in this world around us and the demons are going to kind of come and they're going to try to beat us up like they beat up saint anthony or they're going to come they're going to and of course they're going to be wily the devil is out there like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and he's going to come sometimes he'll roar but sometimes he'll come as a snake and he'll whisper in your ear and we need to know to whom to listen and we need to get on our knees and pray or lie down on our faces we need to rediscover the strength and the power of these ancient stories of the Desert Fathers, the great teachings of uh, St. Athanasius and his successors like St. Cyril, St. Maximus the Confessor, Gregory Palamas, yeah, so those are all Eastern Fathers, to reinvigorate our hearts and our lives to be set on fire and thereby set the world on fire and keep the demons at bay. So those are my thoughts for today. Sword and sorcery. I didn't bring power metal into it. 
but I brought in the Desert Fathers, St. Athanasius. And if you want to think more deeply about St. Athanasius and what his rich teachings have to offer us today, I do recommend you sign up for my course with Davin and Hall running this summer, starting in July. And with that, I bid you adieu. <laughs>